Hi, everybody. Class recording has started. Sorry, I probably should have started it before we had that discussion. But So up on the board, right, there's our list of things that we said were similarities and differences between ionic bonds and covalent bonds, right? All right, so question about any of that stuff to get us started. Good there? Okay, let's review covalent bonding quickly. So, Joe, you brought up the first difference between ionic bonding and covalent bonding, right? What is that first difference? Uh, sharing versus transfer, right? That ionic bond involves a complete transfer of electrons from one atom to another. Specifically, Maddie, what kind of, how do electrons transfer in ionic bonding? How do electrons move during ionic bonding? Metals bond? to non from metals to non-metals, right? But then we're dealing with co covalent bonding, we're dealing with two non-metals shared, right? <laughs> All right, we introduced the term molecule. We said a molecule is a group of atoms held together by covalent bonds. If I look at the formula for a compound, how can I tell whether it's a molecule or not? What would I be looking for? If I look at the formula for something, how can I tell whether it's a molecule? same kind of atom. So that's a specific kind of molecule, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay? Two or more. Mm, could be two or more elements, but more specifically, how would I know whether it's a molecule, Katie? It's a group of atoms held together by Right. So how can I tell whether this thing is a molecule or not? These are all molecules. How do I know? Whether it's a covalent bond How do I know whether it's a covalent bond or not? How do I know that? What am I looking for? What types of atoms? Not two different types of atoms, please. Um, two non-metals. Two non-metals, right? Non or could be more than two non-metals. Because the idea behind the molecule, right, is the covalent bond part. Okay? Only non-metals are going to be held together by covalent bonds. So if I see a group of atoms that just has covalent or non-metals in it, I know it's a molecule. Okay? Good there? Sir. Diatomic molecules specifically have two of the same element together, okay? So they are molecules because they're both non-metals, right, like this chlorine and chlorine, but specifically they are the same kind of atom. That's a specific type of molecule that we call a diatomic, okay? All right, good there. Yesterday, I believe we discussed the idea of electronegativity in, like, two words or less. What does electronegativity tell you about an atom? Betty, go ahead. Uh, the atom has to electron attraction, right? How well does that atom attract electrons? And I think I showed you guys this periodic table, yes? Okay. Yeah, yes. That has all the different electronegativity values. Where do we see high electronegativity values and where do we see low electronegativity values? Okay. Well, it's higher than that. Higher in the non-metals, lower in the metals. Because, Katie, what are non-metals generally trying to do? Gain, gain electrons. So they're going to have higher electronegativity values. Why was that important? Why are electronegativity values important for us to know? What did we then use our electronegativity values to do? Why is it important that we understand electronegativity? At least, good. To tell what kind of a bond it is. So. If we look at the two elements that are involved in a bond, and we look at the difference between the electronegativity values, that will tell us what kind of bond exists between those two atoms. We said that if we have a very large difference in electronegativity, one of them is very high, one of them is very low, the one that has a high electronegativity is trying to do what? Gain electrons. What's the one with the low electronegativity trying to do? Technically, it's trying not to gain electrons, but that's the same thing, right? Okay. So if you have a real high difference in electronegativity, one's going to gain, one's going to give, one's going to gain, one's going to lose, and that's when we have an ionic bond. 
right? That's our electron transfer that we talked about before. Okay? But if you have two atoms that are very close in electronegativity value, we get what we call a nonpolar covalent bond. What does it mean when we say that it is nonpolar? Maddie, go ahead. Because neither one of those atoms is doing what more than the other one? I was looking for another word besides sharing. I think you have the right idea, just you're not, maybe not describing it exactly right. When we have a non, when we talk about electronegativity, Maddie, what did we say electronegativity tells us about? Uh, the attraction of atoms. The attraction of oh, electrons. electrons. So, Maddie, we neither we neither have one or the other one that is attracting electrons more than the other one. Okay? Even, even if we have something that has a real high electronegativity. Right? So, there's fluorine. Okay? Sarah, we talked about that fluorine and fluorine can form a bond with one another. That's a diatomic molecule. But each of those fluorine atoms is looking to gain electrons a lot. It has the highest electronegativity value out there. But, but, is either one of those atoms going to want electrons more than the other one? If they have the same electronegativity values, even though both of them want to gain electrons a lot, Neither one of them wants more than the other one. <coughs> so neither one of them, Maddie, going back to the word we had before, neither one of them has a greater attraction for electrons than the other one. Okay? And we said that if we had to draw a picture of the electron cloud, right, what did we say the electron cloud represented? Going back to our atomic theory, we did electron clouds like that in the bottom right-hand corner. What did we say that represented? What does that tell us? Where the electrons are and how they like travel. Maybe not where they are. Where they like they go most you know likely to be. Most yeah. likely to be, right? I just couldn't think of the word. So in this picture, right? Hydrogen, hydrogen. In between the two hydrogens, right? We see kind of a darker area than on the outsides, but. Maddie, if we go back to the way you described it, is either one of these hydrogens darker than the other one? No. Because both of them want electrons exactly the same. But if we get somewhat different between the two of them, we have what we call a polar covalent bond, where now we're sharing electrons, but we're not sharing them evenly. And I think at the end of class yesterday, we looked at this picture. Is that right? Okay. So first, electron cloud, right? Becca, what do we say electron cloud tells us? Where the electrons are most likely to be. Right, electrons are most likely to be. So what do we see about the electron cloud around chlorine versus hydrogen? It's more prominent. It's more prominent. It's bigger, right? If we go back to this periodic table, here's hydrogen, 2.1 electronegativity. Here's chlorine, 3.0 electronegativity, right? Betty, which one's attracting electrons more? Chlorine. Chlorine, because it has what? A higher electron. A higher electronegativity. Therefore, right, if we look at this cloud, this cloud is bigger around chlorine than it is around hydrogen. These two atoms, right in the middle, right, these two atoms here, yes, they are being shared, but because chlorine has a bigger electronegativity value, it holds on to those electrons more so than hydrogen does. Does that make sense? But we said the end result of that was that the chlorine side of the molecule, right, molecule, covalent bond, the chlorine side of the molecule starts becoming a little bit more negative, whereas the hydrogen side is a little more positive. The like real world example I kind of use when we're talking about polarity is this. Uh, so if you make chocolate milk using Hershey syrup or whatever kind of chocolate syrup, we buy, we buy generic chocolate syrup because my kids really like chocolate milk so we go through it fast. 
So, but they don't know the difference between Hershey and like value time. So, you know, whatever. But anyway, so you make chocolate milk with her with chocolate syrup. You stir it up, you drink it, but you don't finish it all. So you let it sit there on the table for a couple minutes. I know. Don't finish all your chocolate milk. That's ridiculous. But if you let it sit there on the table for a while, what starts happening in your chocolate milk? It's going to separate. It's going to start kind of settling out, right? Betty, is the whole glass still chocolate milk? Yes. Yeah. But is it the same on the top as it is on the bottom? No. Not exactly. Go, go ahead. That's what happened to my smoothie today. Yeah, smoothie does that. Oh, yeah, smoothie does that a lot. Is the whole thing still a smoothie? Yes. Yeah. Well, like if you just put your straw at the very bottom, you get all chocolate syrupy, and that's always right. the best part. That's true. If you go towards the top, then it's more milky. Right. Well, that's why you drink the milky part first, and then you can, you know, drink the chocolate syrupy part at the end. I mean. Or you drink it. All you drink it all. It is definitely not gross. No. I mean, that's. I mean, seriously, one of my favorite cereals of all time. Cocoa Krispies, because when you're done, because yes. when you're done with Cocoa Krispies, what do you have in the bowl? Chocolate, chocolate milk. milk. Oh, like, I like chocolate milk. It's just like, chocolate milk. Is there a chocolate milk? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like chocolate what? milk. Okay, chocolate I don't have a different chocolate milk to break this. Chocolate checks. That's chocolate yeah. checks. I've never had chocolate checks. Chocolate checks. checks. I don't like them. I like, I like them. Milk. I like chocolate checks. I like them plain, but if you put them, if you put the chocolate checks in cereal, then all the powder stuff, chocolate comes off in it. Money buddies are so good. I yeah. like cocoa crispies, but I don't like drink the milk after. Any you don't drink milk after you eat the I don't like milk. Oh. I you don't like milk? You don't like milk? I don't like milk. 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 It's milk. It's milk. Oh, God. It's milk. There we go. Milk sounds gross. All right. So, are we good? Okay. Are we good on... Are we good on covalent bonding? Yeah. Okay. Nonpolar, polar, right? Electronegativity, how it all affects it. Okay. Your quiz tomorrow, quiz tomorrow is just over that outline. Okay? Good. You get to use the outline? You may use the outline, yeah. Your quiz tomorrow in class is open note quiz, so you can use the outline. Any other stuff that we did in class, any homework problems from the book you might have done, all available to you. Yes, please. Um, so Covalent bonds for molecules, but ionic bonds for compounds? Tomorrow, we will talk about what ionic bonds form. Ionic bonds form something that we call crystals. Crystals. And, oh, and we will talk oh, about that tomorrow. Great. I once had a crystal making kit. So. Was I making, was I doing ionic bonding? Mm, you were probably, was it like rock candy, basically? You, was it like, you couldn't eat it. Okay. Yeah, it, it might have been ionic bonding, bonding but yeah, like rock candy isn't exactly a crystal by the definition of what a crystal is. We'll no, talk about that more. Time. Are they like the rocks, and then you put in the you mix the stuff, and they put in this lotion? Yeah, it's like water yeah. and then the powder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No formulas. Oh, you, wait, wait. Yes, I would, that's why I want to get to it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, last part of your quiz for tomorrow, we'll deal with formulas and names for covalent compounds. We've already discussed. Formulas and names for ionic compounds. Formulas and names for covalent compounds, a little bit different. In some ways easier, in some ways harder. Okay? First, and this is the sheet that I gave you today. First, what does a chemical formula do for us? Why do we write chemical formulas? Well, really Especially with this like, new background. So, okay? Please go ahead. Why do we do chemical formulas? It like it makes it shorter so you don't have to draw out the whole electron. So it's a shorthand way of representing what's there. Okay? A chemical formula is going to tell us two things. Can you guys even see? With this with this with this with this blue, with this blue background, it's like really dark in here. No, don't so lie up. It's only turn only turn half. The light will make it work. Oh, yeah. not that half. Oh, So a chemical formula is a shorthand way of describing the atoms that make up a compound or a molecule. A chemical formula tells you two things. What does a chemical formula tell you? The number of each atom, but then also, Josh, it also has to tell you what? What kind of atoms and then how many of them there are. So, those are the two things that a formula is going to tell you. Right? What kind of atoms are in this compound? And then how many of those kind of atoms are in that compound? Good there? Okay. I'm going to jump you. 
ahead to the covalent part, that part in the middle that has the examples. I'm going to skip over that for now. Far, go ahead. When you have a covalent bond, yep. so you automatically have a molecule there? If you have a covalent bond, that is a molecule, that group of atoms that are held together. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just two, but there are occasion, or many occasions where it's going to be more than two. If, if it's covalent bond, it's going to be a molecule. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's jump ahead, I'm going to skip this, let's jump ahead straight to covalent compounds. So, like ionic compound names, covalent compound names are based on the elements that are in it. I'm only going to hold you responsible for naming covalent compounds that have two elements in them. So far, these rules don't apply unless we're dealing with an element that only has two kinds of uh, atoms in it. Okay? Two kinds of atoms, not necessarily two atoms total, but two kinds of atoms. Okay. So, the name is based on the names of those two elements. The most, quote unquote, metallic element is listed first. Generally, that's going to be the one on the farthest left of the periodic table. So, closer to the column one. If you have a compound that forms between two elements in the same family, you write the one that's lower first, and you write the one that's higher second. Because in a non-metal case, the lower you go down a family, the less non-metally it is, and the more metally it is. I know those aren't exactly scientific words, but that's what it does for you. And then this last part is why naming covalent compounds is a little bit trickier than naming ionic compounds. This whole idea of the prefixes. And to explain that, let me give you an example. So, here's sodium, here's fluorine. Okay? Sodium, how many valence electrons? One. Fluorine, how many valence electrons? Seven. Seven, based on where it is in the periodic table. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So we know what's going to happen here, yes? Okay. Sodium's a metal. What is it looking to do with this valence electron? Lose it. Lose it. Fluorine picks it up. What's the formula of the compound that is made here in this case? Maddie, go ahead. NAF. Okay. Maddie, name of this compound? Uh, sodium fluoride. Sodium fluoride. Okay. When we're dealing with ionic bonding, we're dealing with compounds that are formed between metals and nonmetals. This is the only option that sodium and fluorine have. This is the only compound that they form. This is it. Okay? But when we're dealing with nonmetals and covalent bonds, that's not the case. Most of you probably know this one, yes? Right? It's what? Carbon dioxide, okay? You exhale it every time you take a breath, okay? Any of you know this? This is carbon monoxide. Carbon dioxide, you breathe out every time you take a breath. It's also in your pop. It makes it all nice and fizzy. Those bubbles are carbon dioxide. This carbon monoxide will kill you, okay? Yeah, you have a carbon monoxide detector in your house. Right, because guess what? If you eat carbon monoxide in your house and you don't know it, guess what's going to happen? You die. You die. Okay? Not, not like a little whiff of carbon monoxide is going to kill you, but enough carbon monoxide will kill you. Okay? Technically, enough carbon dioxide will kill you too, but that's a different story. Okay? The important point being, though, what are the two elements in carbon dioxide? Carbon, carbon and oxygen. What are the two elements in carbon monoxide? Carbon. carbon and oxygen. So you can't just call it carbon oxide. Because what are you talking about? Are you talking about pop bubbles or are you talking about death? Okay. So we have to distinguish between these two. Nonmetals have the ability to form more, some nonmetals have the ability to form more than one compound that contain the same atoms but in a different ratio. And because they're in a different ratio, they have different properties. That's why we have to use the naming system that lets us know how many of the different types of atoms are there. 
You guys have this chart in your outline, correct? Yeah. Okay. So, because you know English, you probably know a good number of these prefixes already. We use these a lot, just in regular words. Okay. But we use them to show you how many of the different kinds of atoms are in those compounds. For example, so we just discussed, okay? Here's the first compound that's on your sheet, CO2. So we said the name is based on the two elements that are in there. So that we've already established the two elements here are what? Carbon and oxygen. Carbon and oxygen. How many carbon atoms <coughs> are there? One. One. How many oxygen atoms are there? Two. two. So the prefix mono gets used if we're talking about one of something. The prefix di gets used if we're talking about two of something. Except if the first element only has one, we just drop the mono. So this is carbon dioxide. Okay. Oh, you change the ending. You change the ending of the last element in these names as well to the I D E. Okay. Next. So, what are the two elements that form this compound? Carbon, carbon and chlorine. How many carbons? Four. Just one. How many chlorines? Four. Four. So, we use the mono for one, but because it's at the beginning, we don't write it. So. Carbon, and then what's the prefix that indicates four? Tetra. 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 So carbon tetra chloride. Okay. Good there. Next, P2O5. What are the two elements that make up this compound? Phosphorus, Phosphorus and oxygen. How many phosphorus atoms are in this compound? Two. Two. Prefix? Di. Di. So, di phosphorus. Then, how many oxygen atoms? Five. Five. What prefix? Penta. Penta. So, penta oxide. Oop. Oxide. Except, when you have two vowels next to one another, you get rid of the one on the prefix, so instead of pentaoxide, pentoxide. it's just pentoxide. Now, on a test, if you, you know, forget to do that or you're not quite sure how to change the name, as long as you have, like if you would have wrote pentaoxide, I'd give you credit for that because you at least knew what you were supposed to do. Okay, good there? All right. CO, right? Two elements? Carbon, oxygen, right? One of each. But if you don't have, if you have one at the beginning here, right, you don't write that. So that's just carbon. But if you have one of the second element, you include the prefix. So monoxide. But once again, two vowels next to one another. So we drop the one on the prefix. So it's just monoxide. Okay, good there. Next, ooh, this is the dangerous one. So if I go what? Dihydrogen. Except, if I go, how many oxygens are in this compound? Just one. So you got to show me that. If it's the second one, you got to show me. So it's dihydrogen. Monoxide. Well, H2O is the ratio of hydrogens to oxygen, right? Call it water. That's the formula. <laughs> Somebody said, well, why well, why do we call it water? Water was around a long time before we had this naming convention that we use to name covalent compounds, right? They didn't know about covalent compounds back in like, you know. Yeah, caveman days, but they knew about water, so we just kind of keep its name. Oh, you know? knew about water. Yeah. Yeah. All right, last one. The two elements that form this compound are nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen and oxygen. 
How many nitrogens? So dinitrogen. Tetroxide. Tetroxide. Oh, I like it. That one's a fun one to say. Like that one? Tetroxide. Alright, how's that? Okay, for quiz so for quiz tomorrow. Quiz tomorrow. Open note. Covalent comp, covalent bonding basics, and then basics of naming covalent formulas. Okay? So right, your quiz is Thursday, but next on block day. Your quiz will be next block day. And I'm gonna let you go back.